What's up y'all, it's Shuffle, and this is the Against the Storm new player guide, so if you played in Early Access and came back to it, or if you just got it on release, we're happy to have you. This game is phenomenal, and it's one of my favorites, even in its young lifespan. It's one of my favorites of all time. I've been playing it for over a year, maybe about a year and a half, and I have hundreds of hours in it. I've cleared hard difficulties and all of that, so I feel like it's going to be helpful to people to cover the basics in a video format. In this guide, you should expect to learn the basic mechanics, how to get started in your settlements, what the gameplay is like, and other tips sprinkled throughout of there. When you begin playing after the tutorials, you will have access to three of the five species. You have to unlock the other two as you level up your profile, but thankfully the first three are the easiest and most straightforward to play. The first race are humans. What fictional fantasy universe wouldn't be complete without just regular people walking around? And humans are oftentimes the safest choice for any settlement. They are the hardest to make happy consistently, but they're also the hardest to piss off. So they will rarely, rarely leave you in tough times unless they get killed or some kind of event happens. So if you're trying to win through Resolve, AKA making your people really happy in the settlement, Humans are a bit of a difficult choice to make that work, but if you need things like farming or ale production or anything just involving crops and that kind of manufacturing, humans are your pick. The next group to talk about are beavers. Much like humans, they are difficult to please, but also difficult to make angry. So they will stick with you for quite a while if need be. And beavers are an interesting choice for any settlement. They specialize in manufacturing, but also in chopping trees, which means that any group of people trying to build a settlement will be usually happy to have beavers just because they're so efficient at chopping down trees and making a lot of stuff. The third race to speak of are lizards. They are in the middle of all five species in terms of difficulty of play, but also in making them happy or making them angry. They have a decent chance to leave you if things go south, but they have a lot of strong upsides to compensate. They are the most hungry species, I would say, where there are a bunch of different foods that they like to eat that you can make in your settlements. And food is a really good early to mid game, even late game source of resolve, which again is keeping people happy. The other benefit of lizards is that they are really good at working with things using fire and meat. So if you need some kind of chef that's making a bunch of skewers and jerky and stuff, or if you need someone to run your hearth, they are always a good bet. The fourth species to talk about are harpies. They are a fun race overall, and they really excel at doing clothing, herbs and mushrooms, and other various manufacturing stuff. A lot of mid-game utility in harpies. The final species to talk about are foxes. These are, in my opinion, the hardest group to run, but they are definitely the biggest payoff, especially at high difficulty. The reason foxes are so difficult is because their specialty housing is the hardest to make, and they have a pretty low starting resolve, so it's easy to make them leave if things go bad. They're also very prone to starving, so if you end up running out of food, they are the first to die. However, if you can deal with all of that, foxes are super good, because as you explore and open up glades, they are the best ones to tackle challenges and events because they get an innate speed bonus to complete the objectives faster. This is something you don't really need early on at lower difficulties, but when you start ascending in prestige, which is the ascending difficulty system, then foxes become more and more helpful because they can shave a lot of time off those objectives. Otherwise, foxes are really good at working with water. So if you have rain collectors, they're good for that. If you have things that are used with water to create other items, they're good at doing that too. And a lot of their utility doesn't really start to shine until mid to late game in the settlement. Once you make it through the tutorial, you are greeted with this screen. This is where you pick where to build your settlements. These are the biomes. And as you scroll out, these are the locations you can travel out to, but you won't be able to reach the far out places early. And most of the time, your goal is to try and hit one of these. So these seals are specialized missions that have various challenges, but if you are able to conquer that region, 
then your next run has more years that it can go through before it resets and you can get a bit farther and you have different advantages. But when you start out down here in the middle, there's usually four different biomes. So there are the Royal Woodlands, probably the easiest to manage. And there are the marshlands, my second easiest to manage. The trees are big mushrooms and stuff, so it's really fun and different. And Scarlet Orchard can be fun because the scenery itself is actually really nice. And they have archaeology sites that you can dig up. And you get different rewards for completing those challenges. So it has something different to the gameplay. What is not shown, at least in the starting area, is the Cursed Woodland. It's under this cloud, but I can't actually click on it. These are fairly difficult for their own reasons, pretty much because you can't see what you're getting into. So it really does require a bit of knowledge and understanding before you can make use of these, because this is something a lot of people hate the first few times they play it, but then after a while you get comfortable because you understand the pace of the game. The other one not shown here, sadly, are the Coral Forests. Coral Forest is one of my favorites, and it's about on par in difficulty as the Scarlet Orchard. And the forest, or the Coral Forest has really interesting trees. So the trees give you different stuff. It can be even meat and a building material called crystallized dew. So lots of fun stuff there, but none of them, or that one isn't here specifically, sadly. And then finally, the sixth biome is the seal biome. This is a specific biome that is only for the seal. And that is if you have enough fragments, which as you can see on the left side, if you have enough of those from building other towns and you're nearby, then you can seal it and do that challenge. Before we pick a place as well, you can see your timeline down here. And every time it hits the blight storm, civilization gets wiped out except for the smoldering city or citadel however you call it, and you have to start again, and the landscape changes. But if you're able to do seals, then every time you take one of these down or reforge it, then it gets easier to go farther, at least at the beginning. And the last thing on here are map modifiers. So they look like this. They're big buildings. They show you bonus things that you get. If they have a green outline, then they are beneficial. And if they have a red one, they're dangerous, but you get better bonuses for finishing them. And the final thing to talk about are the question marks, which are just points of interest. They can be missions or world events. And sometimes I think these buildings as well. For the sake of this, let's say that we did the pro, uh, tutorial and we've gotten the hang of some of the basics. I would start making my way out to a seal, but it's not really going to matter for this tutorial. So just to make things easy, we're going to pick the woodlands. This is the easiest biome to deal with. As you can see here, these symbols, this is the meta progression currency you'll get from making a settlement here. This is just food. This is the most common one. When you've picked where you want to go, you can see your caravans over here. The third one you can unlock later, but these are randomized. The items are randomized. The people are randomized. The amount of people are also randomized and you get a set of base goods that expands over time, but this is what you usually start with. And for the biome itself, before I even pick a race to bring, I usually look at the conditions. So you can see the things that happen in the easy season and the storm season, like what's going to happen there. Any additional effects, like for instance, the lush forests give us more trees, like more wood material. And you can see what's even in the trees. So for this one, it's stuff you'd expect, wood, resin, fiber, eggs like bird nests, and then natural resources. So what do you hope to find on the map? This can influence what you end up taking. You know, if there are a lot of things for meat, you know, meat and eggs and stuff, maybe you want to take lizards. If there are a lot of berries and mushrooms, maybe you'll take harpies, even though we don't have harpies unlocked yet. So it's always important to consider that stuff. And you can see what changes in each one. So as you see here, the Mushroom forest, the, uh, the marshwood, or marshlands, sorry. But yeah, the marshlands, you can see what you get here, just like the other ones, and Scarlet Orchard, same thing. So always make sure you pay attention to this first. I feel like a lot of new players will just skip right past that because they may not even see the tab, but it's really important.
And then if you want to see your rewards and how to win the game, it's in the summary tab, as well as how much soil that you can farm on will be there. Now that we've decided that, we can pick a caravan and some bonuses. Difficulty starts at Settler. If you just want to play on Settler for the first like 100 hours, go ahead. I don't care. Like, do what you want to. But you can scale up the difficulty as far as you want. And once you beat Viceroy, you unlock Prestige. And Prestige goes from 1 to 20. And it's a really big scaling modifier, but it is a lot of fun the better you get at the game. The final thing to consider before we head out are our Embark bonuses. This list will grow over time, as well as the starting points you get. And these are bonus points if you complete certain challenges or objectives. And for the woodlands, I will say that since trees are the big deal here, beavers are pretty good with trees. So we'll take the beaver one. And we only get three points and three choices, so we'll just take these three. Later on, this is going to be much more impactful. But for now, not really. When the game starts up, you can check your drizzle modifiers. This is the first of the three seasons. And you just get little bonuses, which are really nice. And you can just see what you get. And then we have the hostility effects. So the more angry the forest gets at you, the more chance these have to come into play. So it's really important to know what's going to happen here. Maybe not your first few games because you don't really know the mechanics, but like higher difficulty and stuff, checking what these are is incredibly important. When you start off, every settlement's going to look like this at the beginning. You always get one spot in a clearing and you're surrounded by a bunch of, you know, uncharted wilderness. The unexplored spaces are called glades and the ones with no marking are the easy ones. There are no threats if you open these. The ones with the small skulls, these are dangerous ones. They have sizable threats stuff can go wrong but it usually won't end your run and they have more resources in them so usually you want to be pushing for a couple of these the final one is the forbidden glade it's got the big foreboding skull in the middle of it and this thing is really tough because it it's usually home to the hardest challenge you also get the best resources though but also the challenge is if you are unable to meet them because usually you have a time limit, this is potentially run ending. You know, it could be something like it'll start wiping out your food very quickly. It'll kill five or 10 people like this. This can be game ending if you screw up. So only do this if your settlements are doing pretty well. But I do encourage you to try getting to these consistently just to learn how they work, see what it is. And so you can just get that experience. But usually through the course of an entire settlement, you'll probably get one, maybe two of these, but it's very rare to get more than that. Unless you're super good and you go super fast, but for most intents and purposes, we're not going to assume that. So when you start out, you get your hearth, your warehouse. So there's your town center. It's very important. This is where everyone comes to eventually to take a break and eat food and stuff. Not their houses, surprisingly. And with the hearth, you can choose the fuel consumption on who can or how much they can spend or what order they spend it in or what and for this i usually like to go for this kind of order when i start out and for this sea marrow is the hardest to find but you can't pick it normally either so you can't just pick it at the start you have to find it but it's a really really good fuel if you can find it so usually i like to have it up front it burns for a while and the uses are very good, and usually when you find it, you find a lot of it. The next one is coal. Coal's a bit hard to get, because usually you have to burn wood in a kiln to get it, or mine it, for instance. But it's a really efficient fuel, and it's helpful, and it can lower hostility, which we'll talk about in a sec. Oil, usually when I have it, I'm reluctant to spend it, so I'll unclick the spend box, because oil has a lot of purposes. The best thing it's for, in my opinion, at least early game, is there are a lot of these regular dangerous glades that you can go to, and oil beats it. Like 30 of them. If you have 30 oil, it can handle most of these. And that's really nice. So I value oil very highly early. And then wood, the reason it's at priority zero, so you see a three, two, one, zero is because wood is needed for a lot of things, and I don't want to be burning that if I don't need to. So that's my tip on that, at least. 
And then sacrificing fuel, you can see what you get. If you sacrifice wood, you know, it takes 40 a minute baseline, you will reduce hostility, which we'll talk about, I guess now, is this red bar. So this is how angry the forest is at you. And you can see the number up here. This goes zero to whatever. And the more people you have, the more angry the forest is, the more time has passed, the more woodcutters you have, the more you've explored. All that kind of stuff adds up to the forest hating you. And then you can also push back against it a little bit by having the queen get impatient with you, which we'll talk about, and building extra hearths. So you get this one starting out, but you can build more later. So for sacrificing, you can sacrifice any of them. If you mouse over it, it tells you what they do. But these first two are for hostility. Sea Marrow is really good at helping you get through glade challenges. And oil makes people produce things faster. And a very important box is to tick stop after storm. So if you're not planning to use a ton of it, you just want to use it for a bit during the storm, that's a good thing to do. And then finally, in the hearth screen, don't skip the upgrades. So each upgrade for the hearth is really helpful and it's important to try and push this at a reasonable pace. Well, the first one, we just have to put eight people in houses and we have to build four decorations. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Another thing to pay attention to are what your villagers need. So you can open these extended tabs and you can see all the stuff that they want. And it's not easy to get all of these in a run, but usually you want to try and get like three or four just to keep them really happy and they won't leave. The other thing to take note of is the favor button. So if you want to say, hey, beavers are my favorite right now, then you can give them a little boost to resolve and everyone else takes a detriment, as you can see by the numbers. But this resolve level, the higher this is, the better, because the higher the resolve, the more it takes for them to get angry enough to leave. And also if it gets past this blue bar, then the whole bar turns blue, the number turns blue, and you start getting reputation down here at the bottom. So reputation is, it's kind of sad that it's such a small bar at the bottom of the screen, but this is what you need to win. So if you are able to max this bar out by completing challenges, orders, stuff like that, then the game will end because the queen is happy with you. The antithesis of this is the impatience bar. It's the red bar. And you don't want this to fill up. If this hits the end of it before the blue bar is filled, the queen gets unhappy, tells you that the settlement is over, and then you just lose that specific village. Doesn't mean you lose the entire run, but you do lose that village and you have to try making another one. So when starting out, make sure you check what Firekeeper the game defaults you, because all of these have different advantages, so make sure you mouse over them and see what they are. But one of the easiest ones to pop in is the lizard. Lizard fire keepers are very good. Another super easy one are harpies and probably humans. Beavers have their place, but they're probably the weakest of the bunch. And foxes are really good late game fire keepers. So we pick who's going to be keeping the fire. And we can look at our starting blueprints. Game always gives you a few. So the things I look for when I pick early blueprints is I look for more efficient ways to get building materials. So bricks are one of them, planks of wood are another, and fabric is the third. All three of these will go into the vast majority of the things you build. The other thing to consider is fuel. So wood is a very inefficient fuel and you want to get some other source of fuel relatively quickly. So if you can find something like the kiln to get coal, almost an instant pick if it's the first thing I see. And then we get other things to help us build differently. We can make food, lizard houses. So this is specialty housing. So if we build these, our lizards are happier than just regular houses. But after that, it's all about what you think your group needs. And that takes some practice, but let's just get the lizard house. It's a safe pick. And then finally, we come to something like food production. It's not always each category like this, but it just happened to do it this time. And these are important. So camps are how you gather stuff. The big camps let you get the big nodes. Otherwise, you're stuck getting the small ones. And some kind of farm, like an herb garden or a small farm, 
are really good to have because it's constant food, even though it's seasonal. So we can pick that. And as I said, with the seasons, there are three in the year. There's drizzle, then after that is clearance, and then after that is the storm, and then after the storm is drizzle, so it goes in that loop. The easiest one is drizzle, clearance is fine and easy, and storm is where the game gets hard. So you wanna spend the first two seasons preparing for the storm, essentially. The next thing we need to do when we start out is if we pick stuff we wanna build, the, the second tab actually are camps. We always want a woodcutter camp, because that gets us wood and helps us explore and stuff, so we'll build that wherever. You can rotate it with the R key. And the green area is the area in which it will chop trees. And you can tell it to avoid glades, which are these spaces. It doesn't matter if they're big or small, it will avoid them. It can chop everything down if you want. You can mark trees and have those options repeat. So for marking, you can press the F key. It's also down here, this button, this green button or you have unmark, which is the G button, but it'll let you paint the trees. So you can tell your woodcutters you want to get these if they can. And just how F marked them, G, I wish this was a different color, but it unmarks them if you really want to. And if you want to make it like super small and pinpoint, you can actually hold shift. So you see the circle gets smaller and you can go, okay, I just want to go through here and get to this place. And you might have to get something in the middle, but Pretty easy, pretty nice. So for this, we're just gonna put avoid glades. Usually a decent option starting out when you're not quite sure where you wanna go yet. And we're gonna build the other camps for our resources. So what's really nice is if your camp can't pick up the resource, it doesn't show it besides the woodcutter one. And so we see there that stone one doesn't pick mushrooms. However, the herbalist camp does pick mushrooms. You always want your camps somewhat close to a warehouse if you can because when this fills up they're going to run to this to put it away we have one more camp to build that is our harvester camp it gets us some fibers and then after that if we can build some kind of food we should but we don't have any farm fields here so i can't make a farm so we're going to skip that and then there's housing so we have our lizard houses but we have nothing to make them as you can see in the middle there's the fabric and the brick we're just gonna build regular shelters that hold three people. You can make your settlement however you want, but I like to make the first part of it really just efficient and compact. I'll just build all my houses in the middle like this. Since these hold three and we have nine people, we, we are going to need three of them. And then the next thing to do is check our industry. So do we have anything new that we wanna to build to make products? So we can't build our kiln yet. We need bricks. How do we get bricks? The crude workstation. This thing really sucks. If I can be quite honest, you don't want to use this ever. But sometimes it's all you got, so you have to make do. And the crude workstation gives you really inefficient exchange rates to make your basic building stuff. Most of the time, you're not going to need pipes, so I just turn that off. And then we have eight wood to make two planks. Pretty crap ratio. But, you know, it's the best we got. You can also change which buildings get made first by clicking the priority up here and go all the way down to negative five and all the way to plus five. So if you want to make sure it gets built, you can just make it a higher priority than anything else. And the same goes for our crafting stuff. We can go up to three on these. Another really important thing with crafting are limits. This is something a lot of new players won't even think about. So I'm going to make sure that you at least consider it. And limits tell your people when to stop building stuff. You know, if you want 10 planks, once they hit 10, they're done. If it goes to eight, they'll make two more. But this way they don't burn through all your resources doing stuff and you're not aware. Some of the items take multiple or can use multiple things to build it. So you can always select and deselect what you want. It really just depends what you have access to. And same with the, uh, the bricks. So it's gonna build that. And the reason we want to do that is because, actually, I can even show all this right now. So we want to get bricks to make our kilns. So we can make bricks the priority. We can make it so we make, say, six, and then they'll stop. And I can just drop down this kiln somewhere. And whenever they're ready, they'll make the bricks, and then they'll build the kiln if I have builders available. The next tab are your city buildings. Usually you don't need these until you start expanding. 
The only one that's super important somewhat early is the trade post because you get traders, you can buy stuff, sell stuff, and trade with other towns that you built, so it's really helpful. The small hearth is for an expansion. If you start pushing out into the wilderness, you're gonna need another one of these to build like a more efficient base. And you can't build them too close to each other. As you can see, you get this symbol, or this uh, overlapping orange thing. So you wanna make sure that they're not touching, but if you clear out this space, for instance, or like down here, you can put it. And then there are warehouses. So you don't always, since you have the main warehouse in the middle, it's usually good to build a warehouse somewhere else if you have like a lot of resources, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, with a hearth. Like that's okay to do, but not always needed. And finally, we have the Blight Post and Hydrant, which are beyond the scope of this. This is for harder difficulty stuff. And then finally, we have decorations. We have a few starting out, but then we'll unlock more. And as I was saying before, with the hearth, we can upgrade it by making decorations. And it's color coded, thankfully. So we need four green decorations. You can build individual ones if you really want to make your town look nice and spread stuff out. Or if you just want to plop down a park because it's a big old thing of decorations, just drop it down. Now that we have everything kind of picked out that we want to do, because we haven't even unpaused the game yet, we can make some roads. Just build around. I usually like to put roads all around my warehouse just so everyone has access to it. Like this is the one building you don't want locked off beside your hearth. So now we have all this crisscross. Very easy and organized to build with, by the way. And then finally, we can use the time. So we can either just play at normal speed, which, you know, when you're starting out and you're learning, that's fine. Then we can play at like times five, times two, times three, times 1.5, I should say. But one or four or three times is what you're normally going to be shooting for because it's just the fastest. For woodcutters, we can put in our beavers. So this little symbol means that they have a chance of getting double the amount because beavers are very good woodcutters. You usually want to have as many as you can and the hostility from woodcutters goes up. So make sure you're always paying attention to this. We'll unpause. Put one beaver in here to start picking mushrooms because why not? You want to have some food coming in. Put another in here to get some fibers. And then we're probably done right now until some stuff happens. So a really simple way to approach this is what you're going to do for a year. Do you want to make it to a glade? Do you want to build certain structures, farm resources? Usually it's good to have a goal in mind for the year. And then we have cornerstones coming in. So you get to pick one of these per year, but I don't usually pick this until I see what my orders are, which come after. You can't see, sorry. my. There you go. Up here, the mask is the cornerstone, and those, these are all your other buttons, but we're waiting for the orders which come in between. So now we have orders, press T for them, and each one of these gives you a reputation point, which helps you win the game. As we said, you need 12 to finish it, and usually you want to pick something that's easy to accomplish. If both of them are easy, then you look at the rewards, but the reason I prefer the easier ones compared to the better rewards is because reputation wins the game and so you always want to make sure that you have the best chance of that you know it doesn't really matter if you get a slightly better thing if you can't complete it and so for either of these basic housing wood this is pretty easy to do and the rewards are pretty solid so we'll just pick this sometimes you get timed orders so you have like 10 minutes to do something or it fails those are pretty tough but also we're not talking about those too much in this video Let's see resolve Pretty easy. Trading post, we're gonna do this anyway. Let's just pick that. Parts are really good to get, tools are really good to get. Let me get some food. And then let's see, 35 paths, I might have that already. So people dig faster and we get some stones. This is much harder to do because you have to make a bunch of packs. So we're not gonna do that. <clears throat> now that I picked all my stuff, I'm gonna pick a cornerstone. These are your passive bonuses. And you can decline them for 10 amber. Amber is the currency of the game. It's kind of like gold. And these are really good if you can make them work. Some don't work for you, but most of them are usually just super good. And so in this case, we're going to take the bonus to farming goods. We don't have any farms yet, but we will later. And that's it. We're done for the year.
I usually don't have to touch anything from this point, at least for the first year. Now we're about to have our first storm. So I got a couple other things in working order, like people in the workstation, put another person to get berries. And I still have one person free to build, as you can see up here. And we are pushing into this glade. Doesn't really matter if we get it, you know, soon, but just to show you some stuff. And what I want to cover too with your orders is turning them in. You can turn them in the moment they're done if you really want to, but I advise waiting because as you can see at the bottom, we have impatience building up and we have no reputation, but every time we turn in an order, it's going to knock off some reputation or some impatience because we got reputation. See, now we have one to one. And when we turn that in, we get Sometimes we get extra blueprints. You can see what's coming on these pips down here, thankfully. And so just like all, all of our other stuff, we can pick something to build. So let's say we want skewers and biscuits because everyone likes skewers and to an extent biscuits. Actually, it's the other way. Everyone likes biscuits. And now we have a cookhouse. I don't really need to build it yet, so I'm just going to wait. And we're going to see our first storm and also what's in a glade. So I was doing marked trees. They can't quite reach what's in here. I'm assuming it's this one. So do that. I'll make sure they get in there. And here's our first storm. So all of the hostility challenges and stuff that you have will turn on from this point, depending on the level. And as you can see, people's resolve goes down. This increases the longer it goes. The first couple storms aren't too bad, but later on, if you are not prepared, this will end the run. Hands down, very quickly. It'll make a bunch of people leave, and you just can't finish anything. But this first one's pretty tame. So we're going to build into this glade just to show you what it is. And actually, before we do that, some tips on surviving the storm is up here. You want to get as high resolve as possible. So if you can, you want to get specific housing, foods, coats if they need them, things like that. And try and get the easiest ones you can because they all give different amounts of bonuses, but they're all helpful to have. Two things to do to keep resolve up. I don't know what the proper term for this. Some people call it like resolve dancing or something or juggling. What happens is if you have a group that's in danger of leaving, you can favor them. As you see here, the lizards go up by a few points, the beavers, and if we had humans, they would go down by a few points as well. So since there's a minute cooldown on this, you can turn it on for a little bit and then turn it off you know, before people start leaving, when this number hits zero or negative one, for instance. And the other one is you can juggle the resources you're sacrificing. For instance, since wood and coal lowers hostility, if this was up to like level four, you know, I could pop some wood, maybe it'll drop down to three and then things will be okay. But you have to remember when you sacrifice, it burns very fast. So you wanna make sure that you're not doing it needlessly. So if you're able to do that, Sometimes you don't always need to have high resolve on everyone. You can just juggle stuff like that. And we don't have access to it right now. But later on, you get access to rain punk, which are essentially like steampunk, but rain and you get engines. And so with the engines, you can make it so you spend rainwater to make people happy in that building. So you can move people into those buildings as well. Just juggle them around. Well, let's see what's inside this glade and then we'll end our video. One other final tip I want to give about the storm is when you start out, it's only two minutes long. Later on, it's four because it doubles in length. But you also want to make sure that that's advantageous for you because you can still gather storm water during the storm, which is helpful. You can do other things like catch up on production because you can take out your wood cutters, stuff like that. And you don't want to have a shorter storm. There's like an item that shortens it later that you can randomly buy. It's pretty rare, but you don't want to do that if you can help it, because the longer it goes, the more time you have to complete objectives, which actually does matter in the long run. So you can turn that disadvantage into an advantage. And then when the year passes, you end up back in Drizzle and you get another cornerstone. You can pick whatever or decline it for money. And then there are newcomers that show up. So if you want new people in your village, you can look at what they come with, how many of them there are, and just grab that. You can only have up to three species in a settlement, but it's also important that you don't take your newcomers right away if you can't handle it. Like if you don't have the housing, 
You don't have the food. Don't take them. Just let them sit there. It's okay. They don't go away. And now we got into a dangerous glade. As you can see, we have bigger egg baskets. We have caches, which have rewards in them. Or we can send them back to the citadel for reputation points. But this is really where the game kind of takes off. You know, it's fun seeing what's in here and dealing with the challenges. This little icon shows you everything that's in it in case you can't see it. We're going to undo that. And then you can see these challenges. So it'll be something like spend one or two different resources or there's some kind of effect that's happening while you're doing it and you have a time limit to complete it. So usually it's about 13, sometimes like seven minutes. And this can take up to seven and a half minutes or something like that to finish. And then if you're unable to finish it in that time, sometimes it stays, sometimes it disappears, but you have to deal with these consequences. So it'll spawn random stuff, kill people, destroy resources. Basically, you don't want that to happen. So if you're going to open a glade, you want to make sure you can beat it. And it's good to make sure that you have certain resources to help you do that. So training gear, stone, tools, and oil. Sometimes other stuff like tea and incense are pretty good for them. But otherwise, that's it. So this cycle repeats until you fill up your blue bar. And then if the red bar has not been filled, then you successfully complete the settlement and can progress further next time. So thanks so much for watching. Hope you found this helpful. If you got other questions and video ideas, feel free to throw them at me. But again, really happy that you decided to check out the game. It's a phenomenal game, so I hope you enjoy it. And as I said before, thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time.